Normally, I guess uh, most folks would say today, Happy Halloween or something to that effect, right? But we say today, Happy Reformation Day. Happy Reformation Day. We know that also this is the day that you get candy from strangers, right? We don't want to diminish that aspect of it. But really today is something much greater than any amount of candy. Even thousands and thousands of pieces of candy, Mr. Eric, back there, right? It's something much greater. Today is the day that we remember when those men and women, really culminating under those acts of Martin Luther, who was a priest at the time in Roman Catholicism, we remember back to that day, some 504 years ago, in the year 1517, when Martin Luther, by reading God's Word, and he wasn't the first who began to read, but he was the loudest, his hammer, much like mythical Thor's hammer, right, rang out across the world when he struck that nail upon the door of the Wittenberg Church. Wittenberg Church, I guess, if we were being proper. But he came from others like him. John Wycliffe, Jan Hus, or Hus, he became known as the Goose. Uh, other men and women, their wives and others who went before them, who began to read God's Word. And it was in 1515, 1516, as Martin Luther was teaching, and he was preparing for a class at the then Catholic school that he was teaching. He began to prepare by reading Romans and Galatians. He began reading the book of Hebrews and a few Psalms thrown in for, from the Old Testament for good measure. But as he was reading, the stirring that had been in him for a couple of years at that point already, this feeling of emptiness and not being able to do enough and never knowing if he had done enough and if he could be good enough to be righteous before God, all of those things came to a head when he began to read. The just shall live by faith. Our righteousness comes from outside of ourselves. It comes from someone higher than us, someone pure and perfect, and it's none other than Jesus Christ Himself. And in 1517, all of these things were coming to a head and, and a further push, if you will, that, that drove Martin Luther to do what he did. And, and he wasn't looking to start the Lutheran church movement or any other Protestant movement at that time. They were wanting the church to reform. The Catholic church, they wanted to be right again. They wanted the church to be pure like the church had been pure in the days of the apostles and in those early days thereafter in the first couple of centuries. Yes, there's always been false teaching. There have always been those who were ignorant of God's ways or who were just outright perverse and deceptive pertaining to God's ways, seeking to, to throw out and teach the traditions of men. But there was a remnant of the church and even in the dark ages of, of the world, in the dark ages of history, moving into about the year 1000, 1100, 1200 A.D., there was always always a remnant and there was a man John Wycliffe who in 1377 was condemned by Pope Gregory the 10th because he dared to stand up to the Pope and using scripture argued against the traditions of the church that had distorted God's word already in his day the selling of indulgences was already on the table and it was nothing else than a quote unquote divine and there was nothing divine about it but it, they called it a divine fundraiser in order to build St. Peter's Basilica. They were looking for money. The church had lost much money. There was a lot going on in that day. The Black Plague in the 14th century had swept through Europe and England and a third of the populace in that region was wiped out by the plague. We had also seen England and France were engaged in what became known as the Hundred Years War because it lasted, guess how long? Oh, you guys are so smart with your history. But it lasted a hundred years and, and so it had wiped out so much of of humanity still that had remained Remain this war between England and France and so the resources of the church and of the governments and and the resources and the energies of the people were not they were barely existing wages had been frozen and that led to what was known as the peasants revolt in the year 1381 if memory serves and then the Roman Catholic Church herself was growing even more and more corrupt they began to seek power. In fact, in that day, they were more powerful and more wealthy than most kings in most countries in that day, grabbing land. In fact, the Roman Catholic Church owned more than a third of all property that was owned during that day. They declared that the Pope was the leader of the church, but there was a problem in the mid-1300s. 
There were three men who all claimed to be the rightful successor of Peter. Now, mind you, Peter was no pope. Peter was no different than any of the other apostles. And he said so himself. Read in 1 Peter. You'll see that very clearly. Peter was not the first pope, but there were three men who all claimed succession. They all vied for position. One pope set up another pope with a young altar boy and tried to catch him in scandal to discredit him. The, other, the second remaining pope tried to catch the, the first pope in uh, a compromising position with a young lady in the town. Now, these were not godly people by any stretch of the matter. This is true history, my friends. But all of this was going on. And then when finally Pope Gregory XI comes to take power of Rome, he sought after this one who, who dared to stand up and say that everyone deserved to read Scripture in their own language. Amen. And they called for Wycliffe to be brought before the Catholic Council. And Wycliffe stood and using Scripture and nearly solely Scripture, he began to preach out against the heresies, the false teachings, the, the errant ways of Catholicism, begging the Pope, begging Gregory to restore the church to a biblical model of a church. And for all of that, they condemned him. They expelled him, ordered that his writings be burned. They sought his life several times in secret. They humiliated him publicly. Finally, as an outcast, he died um, of a stroke, it would seem. And then, after his death, he had a faithful group of people who had been following the teachings of the Scripture. And it wasn't that he was teaching anything new. It wasn't that he had some new revelation from God, as many claim to have today. What he was doing was reading the Scripture. And he had a group of faithful men and women even. Their families were, were listening to Scripture. And they were learning the Word of God. And they began to translate and help John Wycliffe translate the Scriptures from the Latin, which only the wealthy or the Roman Catholic priesthood could read. They wanted to keep the people, the populace, in the dark. That's how they were able to get away. And we're not here to bash Catholics. Please don't hear that. But we are standing firmly against Catholicism today. That's what the Reformation is all about. The Catholic Church had introduced lie upon lie, tradition of man upon tradition of man, in order to draw people away from the truths of Scripture. They didn't want people to read God's Word for themselves. They had set themselves up to be the one and only interpreter of truth. Wycliffe wouldn't have it. He said if it was up to him that before he died, he would give his life, making sure that even a plowboy knew Scripture better than the Pope or the priesthood. And he set out doing it. And before he died, these others, the Lollards, they became known as, because they were mumblers. They were mumbling against the Pope. They were mumbling against Catholicism. And they were reading, simply going town to town, household to household, reading God's Word in English. And people were weeping over God's Word. They had never heard the Word of God read. And they follow. I mean, there were just caravans of people going from place to place so they could keep hearing God's Word. They were hungry for the truth. Well, Wycliffe died a lonely man in 1384 of an apparent stroke. He had had a series of strokes leading up to this time, we're told. But 44 years after his death, 44 years after his path, passing in the year 1428, the Roman Catholic Church, under then the leadership of the ungodly Martin V, out of pure hatred and anger for what Wycliffe had done in translating Scripture into the common tongue, he had his body dug up from the cemetery. He had the bones and the remains burned. And then, in an unholy fashion, he demanded that the ashes of John Wycliffe be spread out into the river swift. But with God's providential humor, I call it, it came back to backfire because as the Pope did this, as the church stood against the common person having and hearing the word of God in their tongue, the swift river carried very quickly the word of God. And news began to gather what happened to John Wycliffe. And people stood up and continued to rise up in great numbers. And they continued the work of translating the Scriptures. And soon, not only the English um, New Testament was finished, not only the Psalms and the Proverbs, which was mostly all that Wycliffe had finished at that point, but they completed all of the Old and New Testaments into English and began to disperse it, copy after copy, to the people. 
Now the problem was still much like the problem that the first century believers had. They were copying things by hand at this point. But it was during the day of Martin Luther in the 1500s, late 1400s now, moving in. It's about 100 years later, about 14-something. There was a man, Johann Gutenberg. Sound, sound familiar? He began to develop what we know as the printing press. And guess what was the very first things that were printed upon this printing press in mass production? The Bible. The Bible. They wanted the Scriptures into the hands of people. And so <clears throat> Luther, when he nailed his 95 theses on that Wittenberg door, as a, as a priest in that time, he was writing not to make a big stink, not to cause a stir, but in, in 1517 when he nailed that to the door of the Wittenberg church, it was written in Latin. It was meant for the priests. It was meant for them to see and read and began to ascertain what these points of, of contention were against Rome, against the Pope, against Popery, against Catholicism. He wanted the leadership to deal with God's Word in light of these issues. But other people saw this 95 Thesis. And a few that could read Latin began to read it and began to translate it as well into English. And so now that 95 Thesis, these 95 points of contention against Catholicism began to spread like wildfire also. And then the printing press, again, was, had, had come up now. And so this was also mass produced on that printing press and spread out again like a holy wildfire. People wanted the Word of God. So, dear friends, listen. We are Protestants not simply because we're angry, not because we're contentious, right? We're Protestants, and I know we might not all like that word, but we are of the protest that wanted the church to get back to the Word of God. And folks, listen, the Reformation is not finished today. We are still seeking to keep the church pure and holy. Amen? It will never be perfect until the Lord Jesus Christ calls us heavenward or he returns for us, right? And then in that day, we will be known as, uh, we'll know as he knows us, right? We'll know as we are known. Everything will be perfect and pure. The church, the bride of Christ will be made ready for the great feast. The marriage supper of the Lamb will stand there before the judgment seat of Christ in preparation to be judged based on what we've done with all of the gifts and with God's Word. That glorious day is coming. And so until then, we continue to fight and contend for a pure bride. We continue to cast off the shackles of popery or, or, or man-made religion. Even if it's in Protestantism or, or in some denomination, we, we cast those restraints off. We want nothing man-made. Because listen, the only man-made thing in heaven will be the scars that man placed on the body of Jesus Christ. The scars that he still carried in his resurrected body. Amen? That's the only things that will remain of man-made uh, origin. And so there are a few things I would like for us to, to quickly work through here today. A few truths. Originally it was three truths of the Reformation, but I quietly took down that image, that title, and just replaced it with truths um, just generically because we're going to try to, to look at five truths today. If we don't finish today, we'll finish it next Sunday, Lord willing. But these five things are five truths that we continue to proclaim today in the face, not just of Romanism, but in the face of any errant teaching. And so let me just give these to you. I mean, they're, they're in your note sheet uh, handout if you've got one of those. The first thing is this, that we proclaim as Protestants, as a Bible-believing church, we proclaim the supremacy of God's Word, the Word of God, while Rome rejects the supremacy of God's Word. We maintain that God's Word is supreme, even at the expense of being called bibliolaters, idolizing the Scripture. We hold God's Word high because God Himself has placed His Word high. Turn to Psalm 138 and look at verse 2. Psalm 138, verse 2. This is why we as Protestants proclaim that God's Word is worthy of our attention, of our focus, and even, even our love and affection. Because, as we read, Scripture says, I will bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your loving kindness and your truth. I'm thanking you for your loving kindness and your truth, he says. And then he continues, for you have magnified your word according to all your name. 
And some translations even, even this is a little, a little uh, contentious area here, but some even say that this means his word has been elevated above his very name. But it's at least as good. It's at least as worthy. It's at least as magnified as the name of God itself. God's word is God's decree, his desire, his intention, his spokenness, his, his going forth. It is equal of magnitude, according to Psalm 138, verse 2. And so let people call us idolaters of the Bible. We're only agreeing with Psalm 138, verse 2. Although we know rightly that we adore the Scripture because the Scripture is the Word of God. We adore the Scripture because it points us to the God of the Word. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. At least 16 here. All Scripture is inspired by God. It's theonostos. It's God breathed. It's the very breath of God putting out, put out rather into word, into the page or onto the page. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And if you kept reading and looked at the next verse, it would tell you so that there's a reason that God breathed out His Word, that He inspired this Word. There's a reason it's profitable for teaching and reproof and correction and training in righteousness. And it's this, so that the man of God, and man generically, mankind, humanity, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Now, when we hear adequate, we think, eh, it's good enough, right? That's how we understand adequate. Adequate, if you remember, is the Greek word "artios." It means thoroughly prepared or thoroughly equipped. So adequate, equipped for every good work means we are perfectly equipped, perfectly suited for every good work. So what makes us that way? God's word. And so we proclaim the supremacy of God's word. But there are those who reject the supremacy of God's word. And Rome is one such errant institution that does so. She's not alone in doing that, but the Roman church has been elevating her traditions on equal footing with the Word of God for at least 1,500 years. Calling it what they say, quote, sacred tradition and sacred scripture making a single sacred deposit of the Word of God, end quote. They continue in the catechism to teach that the Word of God is only as good as it is rightly interpreted by the magistrate by the Pope or those under the Pope that he gives the rule and authority to. It's definitely not us. Those of us who would proclaim the Word of God alone have been anathematized over 100 times in Romans' teachings. In the Roman Catechism, there's over 100 places where those of us who believe in Scripture and salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, we've been anathematized, which is a fancy word that means we've been condemned to hell by Rome, by Roman Catholicism, and by the Pope, and every Pope since then, we've been condemned to hell for believing in such things. That's right out of their own authoritative tradition. But secondly, we proclaim the undeniable sufficiency of God's Son, Jesus the Christ. The undeniable sufficiency, not just of the Word, and we hold the Word to be supreme, it's our one rule of authority I don't hold the authority. God's Word holds the authority. Amen? I'm an under-shepherd. I'm not equal to Jesus. I'm not His representative on earth. And let me just say, there's no man who is His direct representative on earth. No Pope. That comes from that ideal of the Pope being the mouthpiece of God comes from paganism. It comes from paganism. It comes from Babylonianism that elevates the Pope as the one and only speaker for, for the divine. And folks, that is exactly what the Reformers have fought against. That's exactly what the New Testament contends against and has from its giving. But we proclaim the undeniable sufficiency of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God's Son, the Christ. Rome rejects the sufficiency of the Son. While we know, according to Romans chapter, or excuse me, Hebrews chapter 7, verses 25 through 27, where the Word of God says this, Therefore, He is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through Him. This is Christ Jesus, since He always lives to make intercession for them. So who is inter interceding for us? Jesus. Is He doing it just at a certain time of the day? He always intercedes for us. 
He always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, uh, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. The sacrifice of Jesus upon the cross of Calvary was a once and for final, once and for all sacrifice for sin. No more sacrifices needed, beloved. Hebrews 10.10 10 goes on to explain further. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. The elements of the Lord's Supper do not transubstantiate into the actual body and blood of Jesus. Whereas Rome would teach that they literally change into the body and the blood of Jesus, that means that they are re-sacrificing Jesus every single day all over the world, hundreds and hundreds of times per day. And dear friends, that is nothing shy of just pure blasphemy. And I'm not trying to be ugly, but it is, it is heretical to take God's clear teaching and then try to muddy the waters and say that, that this supper element, wine and bread, actually re-sacrificed Jesus over and over again. Folks, that's anti-biblical. Hebrews 10, 14 continues. <coughs> Excuse me. For by one offering, he, meaning Christ, was perfected for all time. He has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. So those that Jesus saves, he sanctifies us once and for all. Yes, we're being made more and more like Jesus, but there's nothing in the elements that make us more and more like Jesus. He's not being re-sacrificed. He was sacrificed once, and by that one offering on the cross of Calvary, he has perfected those who are drawn to him in saving faith, those who are being sanctified. It goes on to say in verse 18, now, where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. The Old Testament sacrifices for sin do not continue through the magistrum of Roman Catholicism. There is no need for sacrifice offerings for sin any longer, according to Hebrews 10, 18. Amen? Amen. Folks, we're not trying to be ugly or divisive. We're simply continuing the reform the reformation of the church as she had gotten off course around the 300s when under Constantine, when under Constantine and around, what is it, 323, 325, if memory serves, A.D., as he goes forth conquering in the name of that cross, the name of the God of that thing that he didn't really know. Constantine was not saved. There's no evidence that says he was saved. He added Jesus to his other gods that he had already worshipped as a Roman. And in some instances, he was considered a god himself. He was no Christian by the biblical understanding. But what he did do was allow the church to come out of the caves. He didn't make, as some wrongly believe, he didn't make Christianity legal. And Constantine didn't make Christianity the, the official religion of Rome. He did not do that. That came after him. The next leader after him actually did that. Constantine just made it okay to be a Christian if you wanted to. But what he did do, and this part was good, because the church, as the churches were, were being scattered, and as they were looking for leaders, and as those who had been brought up by John and, and, and others, as these men were still teaching and, however, being limited in their old age, as those things were happening, and they're not able to travel and give the word, other men began to vie for these positions of, of influence. And, and you know the heart is wicked above all things, right? Sadly. And so sin creeps in and pride creeps in. And by the time of Constantine, there were five regions of power where there were five um, bishops. Just, that's just a fancy name for a pastor. But they were, they were kind of set up over other pastors. And we can talk more about that on a Wednesday night perhaps. But, but during this time, there was a lot of in bickering, in, uh, even among those five centers. Antioch and Jerusalem still and, 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 and elsewhere. And so, so Constantine allowed them all to come together and basically square off and come to a consensus about who's right 
And it's those who line up with the Word of God. That was the consensus. They want to make sure that only the right books were going to be part of the, the, the canon of Scripture going forward. They didn't declare what the right books were. They just reaffirmed what had been handed down already and made sure some of the false writings were kept out of Scripture because some were already trying to bring in some of these extra biblical things. And so, so that is a good thing that happened during this time. The bad thing, however, was because of Rome's idolatry. Because of the fact that Rome had so many gods that they worshipped. They had pantheons of gods, right? God upon God upon God. And all of these various gods dealt with and, and did different things. What the Roman church, as it began to be developed during that era, they began to take all of those various gods and just demote them into a Christian ideal of sainthood. Sainthood. And so we have St. Peter, and we have St. Mary, and St. this person and that person. But all that was was a, was a uh, Romanizing, a, a Catholicizing of Babylonian paganism and Roman paganism. That's how these things began to creep in. And so there was much worldliness that came in. And because much of Rome centered around the burning of incense and the, and the bowing and kissing of idols... Many in that Roman church, as it was beginning to gain a foothold uh, under Constantine, they brought in the acceptance, the allowance. If you want to kiss the feet of an idol, by no means will we discredit that sign of affection. And it begins to get brought into the religious ceremonies of the quote-unquote church during this time. But folks, listen. Kissing the feet of idols has never saved anyone. The blood of Jesus brings us the forgiveness of sins. Only the blood of Jesus. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. You may remember from our study. It says, quote, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. That's what Jesus has done. And so Luther, I would say, probably had no intent of trying to be symbolic of what Jesus had done on the cross. This was just a common way to issue a content for debate. He wasn't trying to say that what I'm doing is equal to what Jesus did on the cross, as some even have wrongly implied. We know, according to 1 John 1, 7, that there's nothing we can do to add to what Jesus has done for us as the one and only Son of God. John, 1 John 1, 7 says this, that if we walk in the light as He Himself is the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from, what's the word? All. All sin. All sin. There is no sacrifice needed any longer. But Rome rejected and still rejects to this day. And in the 1500s, she reaffirmed at the Council of Trent that she still denied the sufficiency of Jesus and assigned and described and proclaimed and, and commanded that Catholics everywhere hold to not just the sacrifice of Jesus, but also redemption through the sacrifice of the Mass given day upon day continually in perpetuity. Perpetual, right? Perpetuation. Also by promoting the fable of purgatory, they held to this same constraining chain of bondage. Folks, there's no such thing as purgatory. There's no second chance. There's no one, even as um, the Mormon church wrongly believes, there's no way for us to baptize for our deceased loved ones. The Bible says it's appointed once for judgment. Hebrews chapter 9, amen. And then comes what? It's pointed, yeah, it's pointed once for us to die, excuse me, and then comes judgment. Thank you. It's pointed once to die and then comes judgment. You don't go to a holding cell. You don't go to a, a, an intermediate kind of area where you wait to get prayed out. You wait for people to pay enough indulgence. This was nothing more than a fundraiser to build St. Peter's Basilica. It has never brought anyone out of the clutches of sin, death, or hell. And that's why we protest still to this day. Not to be mean, but it's to be loving. Jesus saves, amen? Only Jesus saves. There's nothing that we contribute. Thirdly, we proclaim the supremacy of God's simple, singular gospel as being solely sufficient to save. 
So it's God's Word, it's God's Son, and it's God's one and only gospel that has the power to save. No one's ever been saved any other way. Any other way. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through what? Faith. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. It's God's gift. Salvation is the gift of God, which is why Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, describes the gospel this way. He says, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, and by which also you're saved if you're holding fast the word which I preached to you. Meaning, there's no other gospel that saved you. It's this word. It's this gospel. He says this. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to Scriptures. That's the gospel, amen? That is the gospel that saves us. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. It's not water baptism. It's a spiritual renewal. It's a dead soul being brought to life by God. That's what he's speaking of. It's nothing that we've done, but it's his mercy. Regenerating, renewing us in his Holy Spirit. But sadly, Rome for centuries now has rejected this singular offer of the gospel. And again, declares over a hundred times in the Roman Catholic's uh, catechism, anathema. Condemnation to hell for anyone who would say that we're saved in this way by the gospel. But Galatians 1 verses 6 through 9 has something to say about that. Where Paul is hearing about the church in Galatia. How they had taken the simple pure gospel of God's word. The gospel of Jesus Christ that saves by grace through faith in Christ alone. He had heard that they had perverted it. And he says, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him. Who called you by the grace of God. You're doing so for a different gospel, which is really not another. Meaning, you're doing this for another gospel, but it's not really a gospel. Why? Because there's only one gospel. That's what he's saying. Only, he says, there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Guess what this word accursed is in the Greek? It's the word from which we get the word anathematized. So who is truly cursed to hell? Who is truly condemned to hell? Those who preach a pure gospel according to the word of God, according to the son of God that were saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone? God's word says no. It's those who reject this gospel. So he says, if they preach a different gospel than that, they are to be accursed, anathematized. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. Folks, we say this still today because much of the world's population claims to be Roman Catholic. And they believe because they go to church twice a year maybe, right? The Christers, as we jokingly say. It's sad. We shouldn't joke about such things. It's very sad. Because they confessed to a priest, because they were baptized as an infant with no volition of their own will, they believe that they're going to get into heaven. They believe if their good works outweigh their bad works that God will have mercy on them because they've been wrongly lied to. Blatantly lied to, misled, they're misinformed, they're deceived. Folks, only the gospel of Jesus Christ saves. That's why we say so today still. That's why we stand up to the truth or uh, with the truth. We stand up against what's untrue today. Amen? We must because this is the only gospel by which people can be saved. But Rome has added works to salvation. The gospel, yes, Rome will teach. Yes, we believe the gospel but not the gospel alone. We believe the gospel plus the sacraments. We believe the gospel plus obeying the commandments. We believe the gospel plus doing Eucharist, which they believe, again, is literally the blood and body of Christ. Folks, you know the Bible condemns that as cannibalism? Cannibalism. It's contrary to God's word. They believe if we could do enough good works or pay indulgences. Now, you don't see that in America so much today. 
but the ideal and the practice, that trickery of indulgences is still very prevalent in many of the Latin countries around the world today. Still, there is, a, there is an elevation. There's Latin is still used in many of those places where the people don't speak it and they're lied to and misled. They're deceived into thinking that they can buy their way into heaven. It's only to build monuments to the pride and the vanity of man. But it's never saved anyone. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 through 26 would say to the contrary of that lie that the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. What are we saying? That those who proclaim Catholicism's errant teachings are captive to the will, not of God, but to Satan himself. Therefore, beloved Christian, pray for your family and your friends who have been deceived by the trickery of man's tradition. Amen? We need to plead with those folks salvation by grace through faith in Jesus, which leads us to the fourth point we proclaim. We proclaim the sovereignty of God's great grace. However, Rome rejects the sovereignty of God's great grace. Much like Mormonism, they will use the same lingo, but they have redefined those terms. Grace in Catholicism, much like Mormonism, is good enough, but it has, it's not good enough. Rather, it's good plus the works that you bring with it. It's not quite good enough. But we reject that ideal because the Bible tells us, like in John 1, verse 12 and 13, as many as received Christ, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Even to those who believe in his name, who were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. We believe we're saved by God's saving. Amen? Yes, we come to repent. Yes, we come to believe. But it will never happen if it doesn't start with God. It's God who makes it so. It's not God plus our works. Our works are there after God's initial doings. That's what the scriptures teach. And I know we don't like that in our pride. We want to do something. But the scriptures say that our righteous deeds are nothing more than filthy rags. We come empty-handed to Christ in saving. We have to receive. We come with empty hands open to receive, by grace, the gift of God's saving. And yet, Rome teaches in rejection of God's sovereign saving of grace, they reject such things and say that we have to be baptized in water in order to be born of God. That yes, we can be saved by grace if we're baptized. If we're baptized. And folks, the scriptures would would scream against such things. Rome says, quote, baptism makes the neophyte, which is a a word that means the new convert. So, quote, uh, baptism makes the neophyte a new creature, an adopted son of God and a co-heir with him. And of this baptism, that's in quote, by the way, but they speak of water baptism. You have to be baptized. That's why last rites and baptism... Baptism are so important in Roman Catholicism. But the Bible says that there's nothing that we can do to warrant God's saving grace. We're saved by the grace of God. Which brings us to the last point here. It's God's grace and we're saved as we read earlier. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. By grace alone, through faith only, Christ alone. Amen. But finally we proclaim the security of those who have been redeemed by God. And this is important. Because even in Protestantism, there are those who would would hold this belief back. And there's a reason, I believe, at least one reason, that this is done so in Catholicism. I believe it's done so in Mormonism, in the Jehovah's Witness cult. I believe it's done uh, in many of the Protestant denominations as well. Because if you can hold back the security of faith, if you can hold back someone's assurance, meaning that they will never be certain that they're going to go to heaven, then you can extort something from them until they die. I think that's what it is. You extort money. You extort uh, good deeds. You extort attendance. You extort favor, something, but there is an extortion. There's something still that you're holding out over them so that they'll try to keep doing so that they can be right with God. But the Scripture says there's nothing that we can do. That's why we're Protestant. 
That's why we're of the Reformation in those words. Amen? That's what that means. We are part of the church, the true church. And, and even during those, those dark ages, as we, as we said earlier, even during those dark days, there were the Lollards who had been condemned as heretics along with John Wycliffe by Roman Catholicism because they dared to defy the Pope. There were others like the Waldensians, and rightly pronounced Valdensians, by, by Peter Valdo, who, who, who stood against, as a priest early on, he stood against priesthood. He stood against um, isolation like monkery and, and nunnery. He stood against those things. He stood against the works-based system that Rome had instituted. And he said, this is not what Scripture teach. And Peter Valdo, again, this was in 1127, 1124, somewhere in that era. Peter Valdo, even before Wycliffe was standing purely on God's Word, he was condemned a heretic by Roman Catholicism. And all the Waldensians who have followed condemned as heretics. They were called cultish. But they were holding to the truth of Scripture. And so we come from a long line, even before 1517, even before the official start of the Reformation some 504 years ago. Amen? We come from a long line that have continued staying in the Word of God since the time of the first apostles. We come from a long line. And so we believe, just like the New Testament teaches, that we can be secure in our faith. And here before long, we're going to start a new series of study looking at 1 John. And when we're done, we're going to go to 2 John. And after that, we're going to go, guess where? 3 John, that's right. We're going to hit them in order. But 1 John was written, and it's beautifully written, and I think it's very timely for us to give us a firm footing of why we can know that we are redeemed. There are at least 11 tests, if you will, that the Scriptures identify to help you know if you're walking rightly with God. And if you happen to come upon one of those tests in our study and you don't line up with it, guess what? The Word is, is sure, amen? That means that you and I must what? Move over here to where the Word says, right? We have to get right with the God's Word. But, but we can know that we are redeemed and secure. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Turn there with me. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. We read this. The blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy... Thank God for that mercy. Amen who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Does that mean, oh, well, you're not saved yet. The salvation's coming. No, you're held securely. Your salvation from the day it became, became a reality continues to be a saving reality until you're finally, ultimately glorified. That's the point that Peter's making. Imperishable, undefiled, secured for you. Secured for you. But you know what that tells me? That says no matter what Congress does with the inheritance tax going forward, our inheritance, spiritually speaking, will never be taken away. Not by a Pelosi, a Biden, or anybody. It'll never be taken away. We can pass on this to our children. Amen? We can pass on our faith. We may lose all our property. And if the Lord tarries in coming from us, it will more than likely happen, Christian. It will more than likely happen. Christians are already losing their jobs over, over, over convictions, right? And, and yeah, I know this is about uh, uh, just about being immunized. immunized. I can't say that, excuse me. Right? You can laugh, it's okay. Whether or not to take the jab, but it's not just one, it's like three now. And I read something this weekend, there's five they're talking about. I mean, it's going to be an ever-going process. But, but again, we could lose everything, but this will never be taken away from us. Never, 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 never. This is our spiritual inheritance. This is what the apostles lived and died for. This is what those who came after them lived and died for. This is what, what uh, Wycliffe, this is what uh, Peter Valdo, this is what Tyndale, this is what man and woman, year after year after year, this is what the reformers continue to fight for, that we would have this secure faith. And we know that the Lord keeps those who He saves. In fact, He promises to do so. Now, if anybody's word is believable, I think it's Jesus' word. Amen? Amen? Turn to John chapter 6. Look at verses 37 through 39. 
And this is not very clear, so really pay attention here. And I was being sarcastic. This is extremely clear. Notice, quote, Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will what? Come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Meaning Jesus is saying here, meaning that I am doing the will of my Father. And he goes on. This is the will of him who sent me. That all that he has given me, I lose. What's the word? Nothing. I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. Everyone who comes to Jesus by grace through faith in Jesus alone will be saved. And you'll not just be saved in that moment. You'll be saved forever. If you're truly saved, amen? If you're truly saved, that's what God's word says. It is a divine gift of eternal life. Now, now listen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life or everlasting life. How long is everlasting? I mean, the word itself carries the implication very obviously, that you are saved how long? Forever. Everlasting. So there's no pope, there's no law, there's no government, there's no church council that can tell you otherwise, Christian. Stand on God and His Word. John 10, 28, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Now, now just so we're clear, I give them eternal life. How long is eternal? Forever. Now, the word never used to mean what? The same thing it means today. And what does it mean? It's not going to happen. So he's saying positively, you've got eternal life. He's saying negatively, you can't lose it. So again, what's the answer? You have eternal life. Believe. Romans eleven twenty nine. 29. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Salvation is a gift of God. It is, therefore, irrevocable. He will never take away salvation. But Romans rejected that, saying that you can die in a, in a, in a, in a mortal sin. They divide sins into, into mortal sins and is it venial sins, I believe. And, 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 and one's okay, but the other, if you die in that sin, then you're automatically going to purgatory. And folks, that's nonsense. I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm just trying to be honest. It's nonsense. It's heresy. It's damnable lies. It's damnable. You are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what the proclaimers fought again for. And that's why we still proclaim the same things today. Amen? Amen. So why do we continue to celebrate Halloween? Oh, I mean, Reformation Day. Why do we continue to celebrate Reformation Day? Because it's important. The truths are important. They were a rediscovery and a reestablishment of the revealed truth according to scriptures from the very get-go. Not new truths, just a reacquaintance with the old truths of salvation. Amen? So let's continue to stand on God's Word, holding it high, holding it in a place of honor. It's, we should know it better than any song lyric, even from the 80s, friends. We should know it better than any song lyric, be it uh, new wave, right, uh, uh, country or, or, or otherwise, whatever it might be. Ladies, you should, you should know the Word of God better than you know what kind of pressed shirt that, that George Strait wears every time he performs in public. Men, we should know it better than any athletic stat, even if it's uh, State 2A volleyball championship stats. Ooh, we should know it better than any, any of those things. We should know God's Word and stand on it because in this Word is life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for this word today. We thank you, oh God, oh, for the truths that we find in this word. As Alan said, even in his prayer, oh, this word is precious, and herein we find the way to salvation through Jesus Christ by grace through faith. And so, Father, I pray today that if there be anybody here today with us physically, or if by chance there's anyone watching this live stream who is coming under the convicting power of your Holy Spirit as you draw them to yourself, God, I pray that you would grant that they would realize who they are apart from you, that they would see that they are a sinner in need of your heavenly mercy, that they would cry out, oh, God, have mercy on me, the sinner. Save me, oh, God, from my sin. They would trust in the work of Jesus Christ upon that cross of Calvary alone. That they would be saved by grace, your grace, O oh God, 
poured out uh, uh, to us through Jesus Christ and through their faith in Jesus Christ, believing in their heart that God raised, raised Jesus from the dead and confessing with their tongue that Jesus is Lord, that, that they would be saved. The same way that we're all saved today, O oh God. Through faith, God, we're, we're just, like, just like in the Old Testament, as, as Abraham and others looked in faith to your word, to your standard of truth and to your call upon them, well, we exercise that same kind of faith. And God, shouldn't it be more so as we stand today with so many verifiable truths and facts to look back upon as your word has been preserved for us even through fierce opposition? When Rome tried to keep the Bible from the hands of commoners and when, and when even governments thereafter tried to burn and destroy all copies of, of Scripture, your word has, has stood, O oh God. So may we stand on this word. May we humbly proclaim the truths, not in a prideful fashion, but in a humble fashion, knowing that we're saved by your grace, O oh God. And so, Father, I know that we have friends and loved ones, family members who, who have been deceived and, and, and many in Catholicism, but even others in other works-based religious movements like Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses or, or, or even in Islam, oh God, thinking that we have to do something in order to, to save ourselves or to maintain God. May they be reaffirmed and reassured and use us, oh God. As, as, as mouthpieces, as lights that shine in the darkness, God, even in the year 2021 and beyond, should you dare. Use us continually to point people back to Jesus Christ according to your word. We ask these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.